Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Family Folk Focused Addiction Support Training, Getting Your Life Back. Um, we're really pleased that you're joining us here today. I'm your host, Susan Halden. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the New England Region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. My office is located at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I, let's get an idea of who's joining us today um, while I'm advancing on to the next slide. If you would like to introduce yourself um, using the chat box, tell us your name, where you're located, and if you would like to tell us what you're um, looking to learn today, that would be great as well. So just a few things, um, details about today's webinar. Um, closed captioning is available and the information to um, get the, the captioning is in the chat box. You can click on the link. Um, this webinar is being recorded and um, you will receive an email with a link to the recording in about a week. Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions um, to our presenter, Maureen Cavanaugh, during the last um, 15 minutes or so of the webinar. So if you hear something or see something that um, you'd like to ask about, jot it down and we'll um, give you time at the end. Um, you'll be using the chat box and you can chat your questions um, using the all participants um, um, send to option. Um, medical librarians can receive one CE credit for attending this webinar. Um, you just have to complete an evaluation at the end of the webinar to receive the credits. And that evaluation should automatically appear after you leave the WebEx sec, um, session. And the last slide will have the enrollment code um, that you'll need to, um, to get the CEs. It's actually listed on this slide as FAM1920. I wish that we could offer CE credits to other people. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that set up at the moment. And also, too, um, we would love to have your feedback about the webinar. So even if you're not receiving CE credit, please consider um, completing the evaluation so we can know how to improve our training. For those of you who don't know or are not familiar with the National Library of Medicine, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes um, to explain um, who we are and the health and medical outreach program we have. So the NLM is a physical library and it's located on the campus of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. It's the largest biomedical library in the world and one of the federal government's largest providers of digital content. All of the information from the National Library of Medicine is available online and can be accessed for anyone access by anyone. There's no cost to use any of our online resources, databases, tools, or websites. The mission of the NLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by making health and medical information accessible to everyone. The NLM carries out this mission through its national network that has more than 7,500 members across the United States. This webinar is presented through the New England region. There are seven other regions across the country that provide similar outreach with online health and medical information 
um, training um, webinars or even live training and also grant funding. Those who use our resources form our network and network members come from many different backgrounds and professions. For example, those registered for this webinar are librarians, healthcare providers, public health professionals, educators, students, researchers, first responders, and members of the general public. Anyone can join the network and receive information about the training we offer. Everything the NLM offers is free. Um, the NLM also provides grant funding to organizations that further the NLM mission. Over the past few years, the New England region has funded over $150,000 for substance use disorder related programs and projects in New England. And last year, the network provided training to about 77,000 people. So the NLM provides an extensive amount of information about how to prevent and treat substance use disorder. Um, it provides a wide variety of online addiction addiction prevention and treatment information. NLM resources do not contain any advertising. They're written by medical experts and they're updated on a regular basis. You don't need an account to use them. This slide shows two NLM sites that are a good place to start if you're looking for evidence-based health and medical information about substance use disorder. On the left is a picture of the MedlinePlus.gov um, page you would navigate to if you were to search for opioid addiction. MedlinePlus is the NLM consumer health website. On the right is a picture of the opioid addiction and treatment portal. When you receive the recording link for this webinar, you'll also receive links to all of the substance use disorder resources that are mentioned in this webinar. I just wanted to point out um, just a, a couple of um, handy um, sites and tools and, and then we'll get started with Maureen. So Pillbox is one of NLM's tools that provides data and images for prescription, over-the-counter homeopathic and vet, veterinary pills marketed in the US. This website helps you identify a pill if you were to find one and didn't know what it was. The site contains information about pills such as how they look, their active and inactive ingredients, and many other criteria. If your organization provides health and wellness programming, the New England region has book club kits your organization can borrow. The book pictured in this slide, Sobriety, is one of the kits that you can borrow um, that is related to addiction. So there's a link on this slide um, you can go to to find out more information about this program. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our presenter, Maureen Cavanaugh, now. Maureen received a grant from the New England region a couple of years ago to broaden the reach of her substance use disorder support network called Magnolia New Beginnings. Maureen has continued to find new ways to provide education and support about substance use disorder. She recently published a memoir about her experience of being the mother of a daughter going through um, substance use disorder. So Maureen, I'm gonna pass the ball over to you. If I can find you in my list of participants, there we go. <clears throat> I'm in there somewhere. <laughs> okay. I, oh, it didn't go.
All right. I think you should be all set now. I'm all set. I got the ball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you, Susan, and um, welcome, everybody. And thank you all for taking the time to join us here today and view this webinar, as well as thanks to the National Network of Libraries of Medicine and, of course, my good friend Susan Halpin, who has really compiled, combined an, an incredible set of resources on this disease. And I would encourage anybody to go and really take a look at those pages, because I was um, I, it's a resource that I use all the time and I'm very appreciative of. Um, my hope is that whether you are a librarian, a healthcare or social worker, or a coworker of someone affected, a parent of a child that has struggled with addiction, you will find this information to be helpful and informative. I also hope that if you haven't been affected, and I so wish for you that this, that, that, that this is the case, that you know no one with this disease. I don't, uh, I can't imagine that, but <clears throat> that you will educate yourself and others on addiction after um, listening to this webinar and, and the many other resources that the National Network of Libraries of Medicine have and, on, and talk about how this affects the family and hopefully reach out to someone who is still sick or suffering and their families. Your kind and non-judgmental words can make all the difference. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me so you know who who you're, who's talking to you. Um, I am the president of Magnolia New Beginnings, a national nonprofit and peer support group with over 25,000 members, and Magnolia Recovery Consulting Services, both founded in 2012. I hold a master's degree in education and a master's in public administration. I'm a certified trainer for CCARS Recovery Coach Academy and the Parent Recovery Basics, and that's the training body that certifies all the recovery coaches in Massachusetts. And, and across the country, but definitely Massachusetts. I'm an interventionist trained in the NADAC-approved CFI method, as well as the ARISE method of intervention. I've completed many trainings, including MI, CBT, DBT, craft family therapy, other trauma-informed cares, and other behavioral approaches. I'm a national public speaker on the parent perspective of addiction, and the author of If You Love Me, A Mother's Journey Through Her Daughter's Opioid Addiction, published by Henry Holt McMillan in 2018. In this webinar, I'd like to share with you the need for my newest project, which I call Family-Focused Addiction Support Training, or FAST. FAST is a family-focused intervention designed to define and increase fluency in the language of recovery, educate on substance use disorder, and provide resources for self-care for those affected by another substance use disorder. If you are a parent, a sibling, a member of the extended family, or even a professional working in a setting with individuals recovering from substance use disorder, or in any way closely involved, being educated on the disease and learning the steps to care for yourself is essential if you want to be a healthy, empathetic, and effective supporter, something we often take for granted is ourselves when we're going through this. If none of those things apply to you, not only would I like to meet you, but I'll say educating yourself on the disease in the face of losing 72,000 people from an overdose each year. That's the Gillette Stadium, completely full, football Sunday, and 72,000 people a year just from overdose. It's plain just good citizenship to know these things. The objectives of this course is to understand positive communication styles, the power of stigma, and how blame and shame hinder recovery. We want to learn the stages of change and how they are necessary to the recovery process, learn about recovery and recovery, cap recovery capital, and understand the multiple pathways that are available to treat the disease of addiction. Explore the concept of compassion fatigue and importance of putting the oxygen mask on yourself first to create strategies conducive to your own mental and physical health. Additionally, I will explain the role and importance of family recovery, talk about healthy family boundaries, and share some of my story in order to give you an idea of the reality of the family perspective of addiction if you're not already aware. That is my beautiful child, and that is me before addiction. <laughs> um, there was a point in time when I might have looked at any young person, someone obviously addicted and perhaps homeless, and asked, where is this person's family? I never would have imagined that my beautiful child could become one of those very people. I could not imagine that for years I would search for her 
beg her to get into treatment and would make myself sick with worry, nearly losing everything that was important to me in the process. I would have never asked the question so cavalierly had I known how easily this could happen in my own home to my child, who I loved and adored. The child I watched play soccer and softball, sing in the church choir, and graduate with honors from high school. I was one of many that asked, where did I go wrong? Self-blame and shame are tightly interwoven with addiction. Substance use disorder is one of the most stigmatizing health conditions in the world, and family members often also experience feelings of guilt, embarrassment, and shame related to, love, to a loved one's substance use. Family members may not want to or feel they are unable to share their experiences with others and isolate themselves as a defense to shame. Stigma is a known barrier to treatment and can stop family members from seeking outside support or individual treatment for themselves or their loved ones. We must stop blaming and shaming. The truth is that although environment may contribute to someone turning to drugs and alcohol, that is certainly not the only reason. A study by Hazelton showed that brain physiology plays two major parts in, addic in addiction. First, certain hereditary traits can make an individual more vulnerable to developing a physical dependence after exposure. Secondly, physical changes caused by repeated exposure strengthen the dependence by deteriorating brain function critical to self-regulation. Addiction affects the very part of the brain that controls self-regulation and the motivation to remain abstinent, even in the face of extreme consequences. That's why you will hear people say, why don't they just stop? It's not that easy, and it's physio physiologically not that easy, easy. So yes, no one should start using drugs, but mistakes are made, and often depending on the many factors, the choice to stop may be more difficult or nearly impossible, depending, depending on, amongst other things, heredity, and physiology. Even though many of us are aware of the fact that addiction is a disease that has been categorized as such for decades, there is still all too often the need for the family to ask what they did, what they did to cause the disease and often blame and shame the person affected. Regardless of what you choose to believe, it is a proven fact that blame, shame, and stigma only hinder in a person's ability to get well. Please know that your words matter. Negative stereotypes and pejorative language increase the likelihood that a person will not get help. You cannot shame someone into getting help. If you'd like more information on stigmatizing language and how it affects recovery, you can read studies by Dr. John Kelly from the Research Recovery Institute or go to the dictionary at recoveryanswers.org. It is in the best interest of the person with a substance use disorder that we stop suggesting anyone should hit rock bottom. I had no interest in anyone telling me to let my beautiful daughter hit rock bottom. I now have seen enough to know that rock bottom always has a basement and true rock bottom seemed to be dead. And I was not willing to let that happen, although I didn't know what to do to prevent it either. Tough love was another suggestion. To many that suggested it to me, that included cutting her off and not speaking to her again until she was well. I was told to detach. I could do it with love, but I should detach from the person I brought into this world. Tell me, please, how exactly someone detaches from their child. Instead, I did a hundred unproductive, sometimes seriously dangerous, insane, and once or twice very illegal, things while I was trying to convince my daughter to behave like a reasonable person. Ironic, I know. The problem was I had no one I could ask for advice. I had a wonderful therapist, but she didn't understand, and it was like what it was like to go through the pain of addiction. I needed someone with experience and knowledge to help me find a way to not only deal with the horrible nightmare I was going through, but someone I could trust to teach me about the disease and how to deal with that. We are all way more alike than we are different. Our loved ones and family members often feel unique in their addiction. You may have heard them say that no one understands, and even though others have recovered, they are the exception, unable to make recovery possible. We are unable to convince them otherwise, and we are also buying into that same terminal uniqueness, 
because we are all so much alike, many of the same techniques, family system changes, and messaging can help any family as they have helped many others. Imagine if instead, while a family's loved one received treatment, or even before they were willing to go, they were educated on the disease, on treatment options of all kinds, including medically assisted recovery, on communication skills, they learned about the healthy boundaries and how to maintain them in a loving and caring way, and worked on creating their own recovery and wellness plan for their family. Imagine their loved one coming back to a family that understood the disease and has worked on healing themselves, leaving behind the anger and the fear associated with the family's experience of addiction, and finding more productive and helpful ways to support their loved one and try to get their lives back at the same time. This shouldn't be more fairy tale than truth. Unfortunately, this rarely happens, and the family remains as sick or sicker than their loved one. Healing the family system is integral in healing the individual who beneath the addiction is the same loving person we knew. My goal is to try to change that scenario by speaking about the family perspective and calling for all treatment centers to have a family program that helps to deal with the family along with the person affected. Over the course of the last few years, many opportunities have been presented to tell my story. One is this video. A man named Joe Moffey saw my daughter and I speak at a recovery fest, <clears throat> a sober music festival that took place in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was, that I was the executive director. He went home and wrote a beautiful song and then asked us to be part of the video. It tells our story and that of so many others. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get it to play as part of the webinar, but I encourage you to copy the web address and watch it after the webinar. It's a tearjerker. If You Love Me, which was published by Henry Holt McMillan in uh, 2018 and will be released in paperback next year, was another opportunity to share my, my journey. This was a difficult <clears throat> Excuse me. This was a difficult decision. No one that goes through this, um, it's difficult enough to talk about it, but the idea of putting probably the most horrific experience of my life and my daughter's life in um, down for the whole world to read was a very difficult decision. And the reason why I did it is because I knew the loneliness that I felt when I was first going through this. I thought I was the only one doing all of the crazy things I was doing. I was doing a lot of crazy things because I didn't know any better. I, um, I also knew that when people found this book, they would connect to other resources because they're in the back of the book, along with feeling not so alone. But I realized um, shortly after the book came out that I was also writing this so that others could read it and understand what it's like for a family to go through this and who this happens to. Because, because I found that there was this idea of, of what kind of family this happens to. And as I went through it, and I met thousands of other people that were going through it, I realized that who this happens to is anybody. And the one commonality is that everybody loves their children and nobody wants this to happen. So my story was worthy of a book, not because I am so unique, but instead because my story is so very ordinary. Across the country, my story plays out over and over again. I know because I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of letters telling me so. I learned that my daughter had used heroin because she came to me and told me. I immediately got her into an outpatient program and believed because we were so close, she would always tell me if she was struggling. I underestimated the power of the disease, and because she couldn't stop, she began to lie and cover up her use. I was uneducated, and I believed her. The book is called If You Love Me, because after many years, 13 overdoses or more, 40-plus treatment attempts, she came home one night after relapsing again. Some um, She had been doing very well, and some wonderful friends of hers um, who were sober, went out looking for her when she disappeared from the, um, from the sober living she was living in. And they looked for her until about 3 o'clock in the morning when they finally found her. 
and she um, didn't really want to come home, but they convinced her. She was in my, um, she came in, was on my um, kitchen floor, sitting up, sitting, looking up at me, totally distraught, disappointed in herself, um, just pretty much done. And she looked up at me, and I told her two things she already knew. I said, Katie, I love you so much, and you're going to die. And she looked up at me and said, if you love me, you'll let me die. It wasn't until that moment that I truly understood how much pain she was in. I thought I did. I thought it was um, something that was obvious and I could, and anybody could see, but it was not until that moment when I realized how deep the pain was. Thank God this is not where the story ends. But instead of part of, instead part of a familiar theory of addiction called the stages of change. This is by no means. <laughs> No means, a linear process. Individuals may enter treatment at any point along the model, any, at any of the stages, and may actually digress to previous stages as a result of relapse. The model assumes that different people start at different points in the process. Some may experience setbacks and drop back, whereas others may move forward without setbacks. Stage one, as you can see, <clears throat> is the pre-contemplation stage. In this stage, the person may be experiencing some negative issues associated with their substance use. We've all known that person. It seems like they're the only one that doesn't know that they have a problem. In this stage, the client has little, the person has little or no motivation to change their behavior, as they don't really view themselves as having a problem. We're just having fun. I heard that. Stage two was, is called the contemplation stage. In the second stage, the individual may realize that their behavior is problematic but they're ambivalent about making changes. The person may have a desire to change and may even have considered changing, but has not invested any real effort into changing their behavior. Stage three is the preparation stage. The individual has made a commitment to changing their behavior and accepted responsibility for doing so. Most individuals in this stage weigh the positive versus the negative. Some individuals may have attempted to develop a plan for change, but in this stage, they have not taken any formal action. I would say that um, Katie spent a long time hovering between two and three. In stage four, in the action stage, the person is actively involved in changing their behavior. Any active effort to change behavior would be enough to categorize them as being in this stage. And most individuals in this stage understand that they are responsible for changing their behavior and often require some form of outside assistance to help them reach their goal. Stage five is called the maintenance stage. In this stage, the individual has developed some aspect of efficiency that has allowed them to change their behavior. They may still be working on change, but they have, have become proficient enough in order to change their behavior. As a general rule, individuals must, be, um, must have about six months in order to qualify, in six months of sobriety for, um, in order to qualify for this stage. And maintenance will go on for the rest of their lives. This is not the kind of thing that goes away, as I'm sure most of you are aware. I'm sorry, let me just, yep, got a little mixed up here. Um, so in this slide, you will say, that recovery may take a very long time. There's no, you, there's no knowing how long it will take, but on an average, it takes about eight years. There's a lot of time spent in um, these four to five years of, of um, attempts and uh, the onset and maybe some help seeking. Um, four to five treatment centers is typical and a lifetime of vigilance on the part of the person affected. The good news is that after, after five years, the rate of re reoccurrence goes down to about 15%, and as many as 66% of people fully recover from substance use disorder depending on the drug. Time is the key. The longer away from the drugs and the more effort spent in building a healthy life, the greater the likelihood that someone will remain sober. They estimate that there are currently 23.5 million people in recovery but what do we do with the time in between? 
a big part of the answer lies in boundaries for the family. Not the cut them off kind of boundaries, but loving boundaries that are in the best interest of the entire family and unique to each family system. Boundaries should be offered as choices, not punishment. We shouldn't be angry at a person suffering, but we, are also, we also have to protect ourselves and them because the effects of the drug prevent our loved one from making healthy decisions. One of the boundaries was, for myself, you may live in my home unless you use drugs. Then I will be available to help you when you're ready, but you can no longer live at home. It was very painful to do that. I was not throwing her out. She made the unfortunate choice not to choose treatment, and therefore she couldn't live in the house. Healthy boundaries are often very difficult, but people are often more likely to change if you offer reasonable alternatives. My story started when my daughter came to me and told me she had tried heroin, had been experimented, and was wor experimenting was worried about her alcohol use. I was stunned. In retrospect, I can see the signs, but in all honesty, at that point, the signs looked a lot like someone moving from adolescence to adulthood. A typical college student. There was no arguing or convincing needed at that point to get Katie into treatment. She was asking for help. Because we were so close, I thought she would always come to me. I underestimated the power of addiction. So when she completed her outpatient program, went right back to using and couldn't stop, she instead started to lie to me and hide her use. I was still looking at my daughter through the lens of a parent that wanted to believe the best. I thought we were in a phase and it would pass. Unfortunately, I was wrong. This began a journey that would lead her to more than 40 entries into treatment and more than 13 overdoses. The support, connection, and education was difficult to find, and I desperately needed it. I knew nothing of the physiology of addiction. I couldn't understand why she couldn't stop. I thought she just wouldn't stop. I had terrific physical boundaries, rules. I would help her, but not with money. And she couldn't live at the house, but I'd help her get into treatment or sober living. It sounded good, but I had zero emotional boundaries. I was combing the streets looking for her, contacting drug dealers and threatening people to stay away. I looked for her and found her in four different states. I could not have been any more unhealthy or any less helpful. I finally began to reach out and attend a local support group, Learn to Cope, and created a network of mothers experiencing the same hell I was going through. I was able to ask for support and information based on others' experiences. This network grew in grew to be Magnolia New Beginnings online peer support, which currently has over 25,000 members. It helped, but of course nothing felt like it would mean anything until my daughter was well again. I held on to hope with my fingernails. Compared to other medical and psychiatric illnesses, substance use disorder is a disorder with a good prognosis. It's estimated that between 42 and 66% of people with a substance use disorder achieve full remission, although it can take time to reach that point. Although the old standard was attending meetings as the sole pathway, the opioid epidemic has, has caused us to rethink this as our only answer. Medically assisted recovery, providing access to the choice of the three FDA approved methods of medically assisted treatment, methadone, suboxone, and Vivitrol, is probably the most controversial among the old People, people of the old thoughts, but as any person who has lost someone to a, to a heroin overdose will tell you, you can't get well if you're dead. A monthly Vivitrol shot, along with therapy and connection to other support, was the safety net that allowed my daughter over two years of sobriety, and that continues today. Sadly, the roller coaster that is all too familiar to a loved one of a person with a substance use disorder can be incredibly painful. They call an addiction a family disease because while one person suffers, while one, while one person may be addicted, the entire family suffers. Many people will have a reoccurrence of symptoms or stay stuck in a particular stage. The overall model is quite consistent with the experiences of mental health clinicians who treat all types of different mental health disorders, including substance abuse issues. The process of lapsing or relapsing, or what we now call a reoccurrence of symptoms, 
is relatively common in individuals recovering from a substance use disorder. And in some cases, relapses are accompanied by entire attitude shifts that result in these people starting over again. Recovery from a substance use disorder is rarely accomplished in a linear fashion without setbacks. You may have heard the old adage, you can't drink from an empty well. It couldn't be more true than in the case of supporting someone with a substance use disorder. Compassion fatigue is defined as an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with the suffering of others to the degree that secondary traumatic stress develops in the individual providing aid. This not only de deeply affects families, but also many people working in the helping professions. Increased isolation, increased isolation, chronic daytime fatigue, and poor quality of sleep at night, emotional instability, irritability, crying spells, expressed or observed apathy toward work relationships in the future, use of substances or other activities in excess to numb emotions, including food, which was my drug of choice, persistent rumination, preoccupation, and an inflated sense of personal responsibility in the outcome. I believed with all my heart that I needed to do something and no one else could. Unexplained somatic symptoms such as gastrointestinal distress, headaches, chronic pain, pain or lingering colds. Another common hallmark of compassion fatigue is not being able to turn the thoughts of the person suffering off. However, if this preoccupation pro progresses to its intrusive thoughts, flash flashbacks, or nightmares of a specific traumatic incident, in, sorry, incident, you are experiencing more than compassion fatigue. Will some of these symptoms of compassion fatigue and PTSD overlap? PTSD is a, is a distinctly separate and more serious anxiety disorder that requires professional treatment. I've known many people and, you know, myself to a certain degree that experience PTSD, but I've known many people that have had to resuscitate their own children and, and experience P significant PTSD after that. The best and most important thing you can do to help your loved one or those you work with is to find help for yourself and connect with Recovery Capital, which we will discuss next. In the U.S., Betty Ford Institute consensus to find recovery as a voluntary, maintained lifestyle, lifestyle characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. CCAR, the certifying body of most recovery coaches, states that you are, are in recovery when you say you are. Two ends of the spectrum there. Either way, recovery may look different depending on the person, but the common theme, I believe, would be an improvement in health and lifestyle. Researchers and clinicians have devised the construct of recovery capital in order to refer Sorry, refer to the sum of resources needed to initiate and sustain recovery from substance misuse. The key components of recovery capital, as defined by Cloud and Granfield, are, are social capital, which is um, all your resource, all the resources a person has, all their relationships and the obligations that come with those relationships, such as family commitments. And um, the second is physical capital, tangible apps, assets, money, property things that will enable you to maybe move from one place to the next to get away from um, friends or networks that were not helpful or to afford to go into treatment. Human capital, um, your skills and your positive, um, positive health aspirations and goals, uh, personal resources that enable you to um, continue on your recovery journey. And cultural capital, which include values, beliefs, and attitudes that link to social conformity and the ability to fit into a dominant social behavior. A good recovery wellness plan will address all four of these aspects of recovery. But what about the family? Addiction is a family disease. We have all heard that said, but rarely is there any help for the family. Just try and search for help for, for the family and aside from Al-Anon and Naranon, or if you're fortunate enough to be in Massachusetts, learn to cope, we are often quoted the three C's and sent on our way. You didn't cause the problem, you can't control the problem, you can't cure the problem. Well, that's great. Not very helpful, but it's good to know. 
At best, if your loved one agrees to treatment, the treatment center may offer you a short class or meeting with a family therapist. My daughter walked into treatment more than 40 times, some excellent and well-known, tre well-known treatment centers, and I was offered one, one hour long class and two family therapy sessions in total. With any luck at all, a loved one will enter treatment, spend a minimum of 28 days, and will go on to aftercare or, or longer term treatment. The family, on the other hand, as the most important support system of this person, and also more than likely to be traumatized both financially and emotionally, is left to fend for themselves and with limited resources. The family and loved ones become as sick or sicker than the person who has gone to treatment during active addiction. We develop patterns of behavior that don't work for either ourselves or the person newly in recovery. Our world all too often is turned upside down. Addiction is a family disease because everyone feels the pain and suffers the consequences, yet only one person receives treatment, and then we send that person back to the family dynamic that has not been educated or healed unless the family has sought out and found reliable information. At a time when they are taking that first few new breaths of relief, or possibly just waiting for the other shoe to drop if they have been through this more than once. All of the old habits and patterns have not been addressed. If you get any clear information on, on how to better communicate, or any real information on the physiology of addiction or the stages of change. We are all in such a panic over the person with a substance use disorder, and understandably so, that our own needs are not given more than a second thought. I would like to introduce the idea into, into co common practice of a family recovery coach. A family recovery coach is someone who encourages and motivates, who will sit down with the family and offer resources and education. Family recovery coach is not a therapist or a clinician, although they may be if they take the training, the, but they are, they are not that as, um, as a rule. I had a wonderful therapist when I was going through this, but she wasn't informed on addiction or able to empathize from firsthand experience. I'm not sure what I would have done without her, but she couldn't help me in this particular case. She didn't know where to find resources ahead of vet, a VETA treatment center. She wanted to help and did, just not with this particular all-consuming part of my life. FAST is the Family, addiction, family Focused Addiction Support Training is a, is a compilation of many trainings, both on methods of response to substance use disorder and behavioral health approaches and my own personal experience. The personal experience, I will tell you, is the most, was the most difficult learning process of all. I would like others to benefit from all that knowledge. My, t my intent is to train others in this method and enlist treatment centers to include families in the recovery process. We matter and we need help. The curriculum is currently being developed with the goal of NADAC certification early next year. I feel very strongly, strongly that this is a huge gap that needs to be addressed. Today, Katie celebrates more than two years of sobriety and I cherish every moment of it. I continue to do this work in honor of all of those we've lost in hopes that we can somehow turn the tide. During the worst period of my daughter's addiction, I created Magnolia New Beginnings. The mission was to create an online peer community for those that are supporting someone with a substance use disorder and to raise funds for sober living for those motivated individuals that were financially unable to do so themselves in order for them to continue their recovery in a safe, supported environment. We'll probably give out about 60 or 70 scholarships this year in the state of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, this is not something that's covered by MassHealth, um, so people can go into treatment in Massachusetts, and, um, but then often come out to have to go back to the same unsafe or, um, or dangerous uh, situations they were in before. In order to address the lack of family support and to open up the discussion on what a family goes through when a loved one is caught in the cycle of addiction, I offer training, speaking, family recovery coaching, interventions, and consulting through Magnolia Recovery and Consulting Services. You can also listen to uh, the Collateral Damage podcast, and um, where I have uh, many experts in the field, and I talk to them and, give, and hopefully inform other people. Thank you very much for listening. I know that we're going to leave some time open for questions.
and I don't know whether Susan is going to give me the ball back <laughs> or um, or whether she's going to take the ball. <laughs> um, thanks so much for the information, um, Maureen. So, um, yeah, I guess I will take the ball back here. And um, I guess we'd like to open this up now to um, questions from people. I, for some reason, I am having trouble with the ball today. <laughs> Don't drop you the know ball, what, Susan. Maureen, just, if you could just advance the slide. Okay. All right, so if um, you have questions, if you could put them in the chat box. And while we're waiting for others to um, have questions, I have a question. I was wondering, Maureen, um, how, how did you finally come to understand that addiction is a disease? Um, I, guess, I guess the reason why I ask that is um, I happened to see Dr. Ruth Poti give um, a presentation about um, the physiology of addiction and she gave some clear evidence-based information about what happens to the brain and that is when I discovered this is a disease because I also lived with addiction in my family. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, what, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I also heard her give that presentation, and I probably now heard her give that presentation about 10 times because I adore her. And I think that um, it's not necessarily because I, I also had heard before her at a Learn to Cope meeting, I heard Dr. John Kelly speak and talk about the physiology of addiction, but it was something about the way she said it. Um, she And I still, every time I listen to her talk, I learn something new. She's very generous with um, with uh, everything she does, but she allows, uh, she has on YouTube, if you look up Ruth Pote, you can see, it's P-O-T-E-E, -E, I think, right? Um, yes, I just, I did just put her link in the chat oh, box. Good. It's amazing. She's got YouTube videos out there, and she runs through this just very simple, concise, easy to understand, but... Um, something that's eye-opening because I, I guess I knew it was a disease, but did I really believe it was a disease? I'm not sure. And then I, I heard her talk and I heard Dr. Kelly talk and they explained how, how um, heroin, for example, affects, affects the dopamine levels and how, yes. um, you know, and how a person, it takes a very long time to get back to normal. In, even after they stop, so and where what parts of the brain are affected by addiction, and she talks about it. She's a doctor, but she talks about it like she's not not like a doctor, like like a uh, you know just a person. <laughs> so for everybody that's not a doctor and and doesn't don't you know you don't speak in that medical jargon, she was um, she opened my eyes up to it too. So yeah, I mean I thought that was that was uh, pivotal. I uh, was listening to her. Okay, I see a couple of questions in the chat box. So um, here's a question. I'm in Colorado. How can I start a group here? I think she means the Magnolia. Um, um, she can contact me. We have a couple of people in Colorado that have been wanting to start a group. So um, you wouldn't be alone, that's for sure. There's um, a, quite a few people that want to start their own group. We have a main group or a national group, we call it. and. Um, that has about, I want to say about 3,000 people in it. So a lot of the states where there isn't a specific group, there's a, um, we have the, um, the national group, but there's plenty of people in Colorado that would love to join her. So she can just contact me. All right, so I will put your email address in the chat box in one second. Um, there's a second question that says, can you please give more examples about boundaries as a choice and not um, as a punishment? Sure. Um, we're not, I mean, when you want, when you want what's best for somebody, um, I mean, in, in my case, it was, I wanted her to stop using heroin. Um, you can, 
you you offer you you're not angry at them so you're not trying i was never trying to punish her i was never ang mad at her i just wanted her to to stick around i didn't want her to kill herself so i offered choices that would that would prevent me from enabling her but and would also be seen as a choice there were um i wouldn't give her money but she if she met me i would buy her breakfast there's lots of times where um, she wanted to come home, but I couldn't have her in my house if she was using drugs. So we would, and we believe this is a whole family. That was probably one of the most important things is the whole family had to agree on this, that this, these are the things that we will do for you. And you are always welcome home. You're just not welcome home when you're using drugs. But if you can, if you want to come home and you can't stop, I will do anything I can to help you. But that's my, that was my one, you know, one line in the sand, no drugs. So that was not punishment by any stretch of the imagination. It was, it was boundaries. All right. So a couple of people have asked about, um, one was listening on her phone and she didn't get to see any slides. And another person would like a member of their family to hear this. So all of you who have registered for this webinar will receive a recording link, as well as all of the resources that have been mentioned um, in this webinar. So I'll even take the resources um, that are in the chat box, and um, you will have access to that too. It takes me about a week to get the um, link out to you because I need to combine the captioning file with um, the, the recording link. But as long as you're on this list, you will receive um, the, you'll be able to listen to it and have access to the slides and um, links to all the resources. So I'm just trying to see if there are any more questions here before we close. Um, people are saying thank you. Um, so I'll just keep that open, and I just wanted to mention to our audience that, um, well, first of all, let me thank Maureen. I, um, I so appreciate um, you sharing your story and also the resources that you're involved in, the Collateral Damage podcast that anyone can watch. Um, you can buy her book off of Amazon. You can also... Um, be part of the Magnolia New Beginnings um, support group, um, which is all online. Um, thank you everyone who attended today. Um, please give us your feedback. I also wanted to mention, um, so actually let me just put the evaluation link um, and code in. The link should pop up automatically, but I'll give you the code here. Um, so that's in the chat box, but we have a couple of other um, webinars coming up, um, and let's see, they're listed on this next slide. So the author of Beautiful Boy and Clean, um, David Sheff, will be presenting um, some of his research work um, to us October 9th from 3 to 4. And again, if the time is not convenient for you, if you register, you will be on the email list to get the webinar recording and the materials. Of course, we would love you to come um, live to the webinar because you'll be able to ask David questions. Um, in December, we have Fred Mensch, who's the president of the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. They have tons, um, this organization has tons of free online resources um, um, for engaging parents and caregivers um, um, in substance use disorder prevention and recovery. That's December 5th. And then we have a speaker from a documentary film, um, Beyond the Wall, Louis Diaz, who is going to be talking about his um, work with um, those returning to the community after spending time in um, jails for substance use disorder-related 
crimes, and he's doing a lot of work with substance use disorder prevention and education as well. So that webinar is coming up on January 30th. All right, and let me just see if there are any other questions. I, I don't see any more. So again, um, Maureen, um, thank you very much for the information, and we'll make sure your um, email address is part of the resources as well Wonderful. for people. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good rest of the afternoon. I'm just going to leave this slide up for a little bit longer. I had trouble advancing it, um, but just so you know. And actually, I will put the link um, for the rest of these webinars in the chat box. And I'll put the evaluation link and code, too. Oh, wait a minute, I get that.